everyone. My name is Lori Ann Smith. Welcome to the show. I'm extremely glad to be here tonight. I have a very special guest, Maureen Rule. I count her as a friend, and she's uh, the wonderful lady. And I know you're just going to love her. And um, we have uh, an interesting conversation coming up here. That's what we're calling the show. It's a conversation. And um, we're going to talk about Maureen's book. Maureen is uh, an author. She's an advocate, and she wrote a book that is called, she's written more than one book, but this book we're going to talk about tonight, um, it's a, an interactive book. It's called Frozen Tears, and uh, Maureen's a survivor of abuse. She's a dedicated mother. She's a grandmother. She's a wife. Uh, she's a child advocate and a public speaker, and she's got a great book that is a great teaching tool, and we're going to let Maureen tell you about it. And tell you about a little bit about her work and about you know who she is and what she's what she's doing. Hello, Maureen. Hi. Thank you very much. You. <laughs> this is great. I'm happy you're here, and I'm happy to be here myself. Well, thank you. I'd it's love wonderful. to share with you the I, my book. It is called Frozen Tears. I have a copy right here. It has a uh, ice cream cone on the cover. I am a child of incest, rape, and abuse. It took me a very long time to have the courage to say those things and come out. Um, and I even remember as a child looking for that safe place in all the pain. And I guess to me, what brought me a lot of joy and still does is a good ice cream cone, a nice sugar wafer. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I love it. It's a, it's, and I thought to myself, I'm like that ice cream cone. They can, that, that was my safe place where I went. May sound strange, but everyone has a, a place where if you don't find a safe place, to get through the terror, to get through the pain of abuse, you're going to it's going to manifest itself somehow. Yeah. I even remember trying to tell my Sunday school teacher with the little alphabet blocks, trying to form words with those blocks to let her know that you know, I was in pain, but in my mind, I was too small. I couldn't use the blocks. Really. But when I put words together and work with people who, who, who want to chat with me about their abuse, I tell them, to me, this is as basic as a building block, an alphabet building block. One step at a time, one letter at a time, to formulate a word and then formulate a sentence. And the sentences do come. But I think people like a real quick answer. And they're like, I don't have a whole lot of time. But yeah, if you want to tell me about your abuse, go ahead. And it's like, oh, geez, how do you sum up years of abuse in just a few sentences? Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's right. I know that some people, typically adults, they say, well, that subject of child abuse is just too uncomfortable for me to talk about. Mm -hmm. well, I'm here to ask you a question. If you're an adult and it's difficult, what do you think these little people are going through? It's very difficult for them. That's right. I think we need to change the conversation from what is comfortable for an adult to, oh my gosh, is this child in need? Um, if you see something, say something. Why is that so hard? And, but apparently we're much too busy we have schedules to maintain, we have places to be, people to see, and oh, if we see some a child getting 
pounded on by an adult, we think, oh, well, I don't have the time to get involved in that. Um, I might involve police. I just can't take a chunk out, out of my time, my precious time to save a child. And I think we all need to really ask ourselves, is that really what we're telling ourselves? Have we convinced ourselves that we don't have time? Because one of you is well-educated people. I think that we need to finally look it in the eye, confirm it, and to do it again. Someone said, but child abuse is just not a big deal. Oh. Yeah. What? You're saying what? Um, you, you tell them some statistics and they're like, well, that happened somewhere else. Well, I'm here to tell my friends and family and followers that advocacy is difficult work. It's hard work. It's keep you up at night. It makes you violently ill. It makes you cry. It touches parts of yourself in ways that aren't uncomfortable, but someone has to save the children and you must make time. I wrote the book because they said, well, I won't, even if I had the time, I don't know how I would even begin to talk about that subject. I've taken that duty away. I've put it in this book that you can work with a child or a therapist, a police officer, a nurse in the emergency room, a doctor at his clinic. It can be a, a textbook for perhaps so that the nurses teaching, training, that they would at least be aware that somebody who's in the ER and have been abused as a child. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's more for pre preparation to change the world and I couldn't have this book out there if it wouldn't be for the advocates United for Humanity chapter who stand by me and I know you've worked with them I can't say much about it but my hometown of Anvil, Pennsylvania in May lost a young man a, a nine-year-old boy, oh. and the same thing happened. Oh yeah, yeah. Just recently in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. Now, if we are not going to take the time to listen to this message from two boys whose lives are over, and ch make changes in our lives, even if they're uncomfortable, and advocate for them. Yeah. Like to raise a child. It's not about turning our eye to problems because they just don't fit into our day. We might have to be inconvenienced, but it's there were women who were inconvenienced enough to help me. Marion, Charlie, Mrs. Two people in my life. We had no expertise either in child abuse. They had never had it touch their lives, but they noticed that something was off with me. And they worked with me about it. I will forever be in their debt. That's awesome. Yeah, it's good to have people in our lives that, you know, see, you know, see us for, you know, the what we've actually been through. And they may have not been abused themselves, you know, but they they want to help. You know what I mean? Um, I just think that the issue, like what you were talking about there, um, that so many people... Uh, you know, I mean, this is this is a worldwide issue. We know that it's a pandemic, and the you know the stats are what they are. Um, it's like one in four girls and one in six boys will experience unwanted sexual touching before the age of eighteen. 
and mm -hmm. that's kind of you know that's the stats for child sexual abuse it's happening i'm a survivor myself of csa child sexual abuse incest and you know if i if people happen to find that out about me it, it's it puts this uncomfortable wedge you know a lot of times people are just they don't know what to say uh they don't know what to even think they don't want to think about it like you were saying maureen you know they it's too uncomfortable you know <laughs> it ruins the day right and it's kind of like you know if we have to think about this it might make us sad and or, or mad or angry and it's like well yeah like you were saying think about the children who the children. are going through this right now as we speak it's the children are living it, and my book takes them page by page with a grandmother, a concerned aunt, someone mm -hmm. who is safe. And you yep. can't emphasize that enough. The person must be a safe individual. That child trusts them, can be a guidance counselor. And yep. the book starts with faces of lots of kids because it doesn't matter if you're poor, if you're rich, if you're black, if you're white, if you're red. It it doesn't matter your parents, what they do for a living. I mean, it it happens through it's a, a it ravages through all social yeah, you know, levels. Mhm. Mm yeah. It just affects anyone and everyone. Yeah, from all the social economic statuses, you know, rich or poor, doesn't matter. All around the world, doesn't matter what country you come from, what your background is. <laughs> it's like, um, no, that's right. Well, I think it's great. I, I got to read your book and I thought, the first thing I thought that I really liked about it was that it was interactive. Um, yeah. Not just something to read and look at and you know say, okay, it's not just a book about, you know, with stats and all this. You can get that other information elsewhere. This is a book d designed for a child and an adult, someone who is, who's, who, who like you said, is a, is a trust, is a figure of trust. It could be a teacher, guidance counselor, doctor, you know, a caring parent. We would hopefully, hopefully, hopefully have a caring parent situation in there. <laughs> with me, that wasn't the case. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way to, you know, this is life for many children. But you'd hope there'd be somebody that could, that could sit down with the child or the children and go through that book page by page. I really liked the way it was set up. And I think that it was easy to, it was easy to look at. It wasn't, uh, it didn't it's it's not an uncomfortable book you know what i mean it, it's it's for children like you said like you said and it, it can it, 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 yeah it can be used by an adult who is working on their inner child they have That's, some issues yeah. and at that moment they feel like a child i've had men who have been in prison and they found some comfort with my book i have had a 90 year old woman who said I want ha this happened to me I wasn't allowed to talk about it to my mother we just didn't talk about things like that yeah she's 100 years old when she passed but before she passed she said I wanted to rectify with the lord you know have this conversation and thank you for your book it's it um is being used in some foster environments foster care environments it it just has a range of opportunities that it can be used, but I specifically made it simple because I'm simple. <laughs> I'm not real. I, I hated tests in school when they said, oh, we're going to have a quiz. It's like, oh, my, I don't it didn't even know my name. And <laughs> expect me to remember what they talked about. Um, I guess they now call it test phobia, but we didn't have a nice name for it when I was a kid. It was just like, oh, no, 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 please. <laughs> Not a test. So I wanted it to be simple. I wanted it to be easy. I wanted to take the difficulty as much out of it as I could. It still is a journey that a safe person has to take with that child. I've had um, therapists use it in sessions with clients of all ages, and they got have had wonderful results from it as well. That's nice to hear. It's mm -hmm. a book I wish I wouldn't have had to write, Lori. I really wish I wouldn't have had to write it. 
Yes, that would have been better. Um, that's the kind of world I want to live in. Yeah, I do. Well, that's yeah, and I mean, you know, as a child advocate, like that's what I do too. And I, you know, if there could never be any more child abuse ever of any type, this world would be a great place. Unfortunately, you know, we know it's happening, right? And, yeah. uh, it's going to happen. So I think your book is very important and a great resource for people. Um, you know, it's kind of, it's along the lines of, of other books out there. That's, I'd say it's, it's got its own uniqueness to it, which is what I really like. Right. But it's kind of like my body belongs to me or whatever. There's, there's many good resources out there. And not to put any of those down because they're all good. The issue is, is your book is... There. I like your book because it's uh, it's different. It's it is. I'm different. <laughs> well, we're all different, <laughs> but it just appealed to me, and I uh, I found it to be because I am a survivor of CSA child sexual abuse too. So when I was going through reading that, I thought, oh, this is very cool. Like, um, you know, it it's 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 got that that it it it's got that innocence to it. You know what I mean? With the ice cream and, you know, asking very simple questions, you know, that a child can answer, a very young, even a very young child um, can answer and, you know, or draw a picture of, you know what I mean? Um, and I just think it was, I just loved it. I thought that was great. So, yeah. I, I have a concern that as the children are out of the schools, many are, many are learning at home. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, some of those homes are not safe places for those children to be. And they're trying to abide by the rules and regulations, trying to keep the noise level down, trying to keep this, the yelling in at a minimum, plus do their, accomplish their schoolwork without real support. Um, the, no, the support that you and I, received. I mean, I, I think school was wonderful. And I loved the kids that I went to school with. And I loved uh, the camaraderie of being on a, you know, on the track team. And, you know, I, yeah, just having the opportunity to go and to be with your peers, you know, yeah. your playmates, your classmates. I mean, at least it was a place to go like an outlet. Um, yeah, you were safe. Nobody was going to beat up on you in school. But usually, um, <laughs> not usually, <laughs> some kids well, experience no, bullying, but, um, but, but you're generally, I mean, you're right, because, I mean, um, normally it's a more, you know, for children being abused at home, school can be a great outlet. And with COVID-19, everybody's stuck at home. These children have no way to escape that abuse. Yeah. I, like what you're saying there, there's nowhere for them to go. No, so, and I'm... They're unchecked. Nobody's checking in. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we are able to open up our our towns and cities again and some sort of normalcy for these children because the longer this goes, I just, I'm going to fear the worst because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm going to go there. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that the children will be well adjusted in the first couple of weeks of school. And, but I'm afraid that there are environments currently that are harmful to children and they have no choice but to be stuck in those environments. And where are they to go? Mm -hmm. you know, where to go? And also, I'm not blaming parents. I'm not blaming adults. This situation befell us all. This is a new chapter for all of us. And I want parents to ask to become teachers, nursing aides, uh, reading uh, aides, you know, the extra resources that children can get at a school. They didn't ask the parents to be all three people for a child. That would be insanely difficult. And I empathize with, with parents in that situation, especially add into that a parent who lost a job. Yes. Who is then surviving on a job well below their abilities and their where they need where they want to be to provide for their families. Yeah. 
We need a whole reset. The world needs a reset. And in that reset, it is my prayer that we consider reevaluating our mindset on the abuse of children. Yeah, I, hope so. I really do. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, parents, I mean, are now CSA child sexual abuse, I mean, that's, that's a huge issue. I mean, abuse is abuse. All types of abuse are harmful. It's kind of like people say, oh, well, what's worse? One, one is one worse than the other. I don't think so. I think abuse is abuse. It's bad. And no child should ever be abused. No, you know, no, no, you know, no animal, no person should ever be abused. I mean, this is how I think about it. Um, but especially children, they can't protect themselves. You know, they need someone. No. To- and so with the COVID-19 thing, I mean, the, the, the issues, uh, I think we're going to have, a, it's going to be brought to the light, I think, coming up here in the near future, just how many more, once they do the studies and the new stats come out, how much more um, child abuse actually happened during this pandemic, during this COVID-19 thing, um, than previous years before. And I bet you it's bad because the reports that were coming out, um, I think we've got a little bit of sound issues tonight for some reason. I was, uh, the, the show that I had done previously, oh, last week or whatever, it was fine. So I'm not sure why. I, I, I'm not certain what, what that is. It sounds like we have a bird. <laughs> yeah, or a dog or something, or a little dog yipping or something. It's it's a sound issue, I think. But I, it's threw a, my, I threw my husband and the dogs out. They're not, there's no, <laughs> not alone. I, I, I said, I need to have complete quiet. And so no TV, no, and my husband can watch the television, be on his computer and read a book at the same time. I, I'm not so well skilled and he knows what's going on. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm focused. I read, I read a book. I, I'm focused on that one book. Um, but he, he amazes me. Um, and I couldn't do, I, I want to say that I'm very fortunate to have someone who loves me in spite of my crippled past in a way, my sort of, you know, it's, I was very afraid. I think I dated three times. I dated once, twice, and then I married him. (laughs) Um, And I'm very fortunate. We have two beautiful sons. We have, uh, I have beautiful daughter-in-laws, daughters in love, and I have uh, grandchildren. I, I couldn't be more blessed. I never thought this for myself. I thought I was going to end up uh, as a drug addict or in the sex industry or anywhere. I, I would I could have made poor choices. Mm-hmm. I can only think that by the grace of God, I made the right choices and took yeah. the, the hard and did the hard work and. There's still a stigma if if people know that you talk to somebody that you have a, a therapist, they're like, oh, you have weakness, you're weak, and I'm like, no, the hardest work I do, I'm very brave. The hardest work I do is to talk to a therapist, That's and right. I have a little box of tools that I can use when I meet people like you. That's right. <laughs> I minded people like you. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome you know this is just it it's um you know abuse um you know because i i do a lot of um uh, well have in the past done a lot of um, like volunteering for for different groups especially for adult survivor uh, groups you know working with adult survivors of child abuse and i mean the issues are really complex and some people like you're saying i mean you know you could have gone any number of routes and kind of made wrong choices, but but by the grace of God, you know, you you, you met the man, you were to, you know after three dates and you married, and <laughs> it's like, you know, it, it, that's wonderful, you know. And I mean, not everybody who who has been abused has a, a horrific adult life later. Some do, you know what I mean. I actually started straightening mine up pretty young. Um, as well, even though I've had difficulties through the years, it mainly just my own not looking, not not getting help sort of thing. But I, I, I realized early on that, you know, if I wanted to have a good life, it was really going to have to be up to me 
to make yeah. better, better choices. You know what I mean? Um, you know, so I, I decided to get off the drugs and straighten up. I'd always been working. You know, I never stole for drugs or anything. I, I had like two or three jobs, you know, pay for these drugs. And it's like, I, I was just working myself into the ground and, and doing drugs and going and, you know, setting myself up for an early grave. And I just thought, you know, by the age of 22, I was like, this is horrible. I want a good life, you know, and you do have to make these choices. But, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, you know, for adult survivors, because as children, you know, if you don't get help, um, you know, which no one, you know, I mean, in my family, we didn't get help. So it's like, no one intervened. It was, we, we did have an intervention done. There was a couple, but the issue is, is that, you know, nothing really happened. So nothing right. changed. Yeah. And he's just continued on. But, um, you know, it's, it's a certain lifestyle. It's kind of like, oh, no, I'm tough. I can handle this. I'm, I'm tough. You know, I've been through a lot and I've, I made it and um, I can handle this. I don't need help. You know what I mean? So all of a sudden it's like later on as an adult, you know, many years down the road, I need help with something. I'm like, oh, I don't need help. I can do this myself. It's, it's that brain training, you know, of, uh, of not reaching out for help. It's, it's a trust issues, a lot of trust issues. Uh, survivors of abuse, I mean, understandably have trust issues. <laughs> but no, I started. Uh, yeah. In the hospital, uh, there was a woman taken at following a rape and the police officer came in and the nurse came in and I was on call and they said, would you come over and be with her? Because she asked for an advocate. And I said, well, sure. So I went. She said, right now, I can't talk to the police officer and right because he's, a you know, a man. And right now, I don't want to deal with that nurse. She says, but you. I see you, it happened to you. You sit down and hold my hand. And it's like, oh my goodness, is it written on my forehead? My forehead. Um, but, and then the nurse said, you know, why did she throw me out? And I said, because she, she, there was so much happening to her. They don't understand, perhaps, you know, they, they try to understand, but there's so much and, Time is limited and everybody wants to get as much as they can, as fresh as possible. And, but it was too much for her. But when she looked at me and said, you, you, it happened to you. So you sit right down here and hold my hand through all this. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I also had a young lady who was, a, she had an RN, BSN. And she said, um, I took a look at your book. And I said, you did. And she goes, yeah, but she said, something's missing. And I said, well, what's that? She said, well, behind your name, you have new letters. I said, oh, I do. And she said, you do? Well, you should put them on your book. I said, S-U-R-V-I-O-R. -R. That's new credentials. That's right. <laughs> First hand, don't no. be antagonistic, because I didn't mean it that way, but it was like, I, I I don't know that you're going to get the full understanding of anything unless you go to an expert in our fields. And un, unfortunately, Laurie, you and I are experts in this field and we're trying our best as as are every advocates out there trying to get people to honestly change their mind. If you see something Say something. Take that extra moment. Um, mm -hmm. I do like that. That my book does have coloring pages. Uh, they it has some questions. Like you said, it goes through a process. And the other thing, at the end of it, if they want to torch it, if they want to keep it and look at it twenty years later and say, "Oh wow, I that's how I felt twenty years ago." Now, it's a resource for victims. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think it's great. It's a it's a journal, you know, basically it's interactive, you know, almost like a journal. I've done a lot of journaling on my healing journey. And yeah. uh, that's kind of what I was looking at it like, you know, you can journal um, and, and even color like you were saying, color. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, the words don't come, especially to a small child, but they can draw. Yes, and, they can. You know, yeah. 
through that drawing or, you know, whatever, a lot of what they're going through will come out on in that drawing. So even now as an adult, I mean, that's part of adult therapy for a lot of people is to experiment with that um, inner child and do that artwork and the drawing and whatnot and um, scribbling, whatever, just, you know, anything, whatever comes to mind, because it's, uh, it's very actually healing to let the, that come out. You know I mean? Whatever it is that needs to come out, comes out on that page. And when I, so, yeah. when I was seven years old, my mother, I said to my mother, mother, what is sex? Well, she was mortified. And she said, I have to take you to the family doctor. There's something wrong with you. Okay, so we went to the family doctor and he said, all you have to remember with children is to be honest. Write the letter, fold it, put it in the envelope, address the envelope and mail it. During her lifetime, she will come to understand, understand what it is about. She's not going to understand everything today at seven years old, but she has the next 10 years to fill in the blanks. But you can't write the letter, not fold it, put it in the envelope, address the envelope, and mail it. You must do, you know, you have to go through the whole process. Don't give kids names for things. Don't, don't make it something that it's not. Don't make it weird, and right. uh, but <laughs> I remember that vividly. Her taking, she says, "Oh, you have to go to the doctor." And I thought, "Oh my gosh, I don't have a belly ache or anything." But she was highly, you know, agitated that I had all of a sudden, you know, asked about this word. But I heard it. I heard it floating around. I, I, it was an innocent word. I had no idea what what it meant, and I just. Right to know what my mom used to say that I uh, I said why before I said mama or dada because I always <laughs> had an inquiring mind I like why why am I doing this why um, <laughs> and I probably did that's not a that's not a bad thing yeah. we also can't I, I I think it's easy to say well I could blame my family or I could blame you know, put it off on my parents, but I don't blame anyone. They each, as I became of age and I became older, I realized they didn't have the resources to deal with what was going on either. They, my mother had never sat down with her parents and discussed even marital relationships. No, even today it's tough, but back in those days, no. They didn't have the wait, and then they say, "Well, we have the talk now." Uh, I'd like to be in on some of those conversations, but uh, <laughs> really, um, but so I cannot blame or chastise another human being for their inequity or failures because that's not what they were. They really did not have the resources uh, to to know beyond. I think sometimes some people are an autopilot. They really don't know where they're going or what they're doing. Do you know what I mean? Have you seen people at the mall? They're like on autopilot. They're like oh, yeah. that. They have. <laughs> and you're like, wow, they're, they're functioning individuals, but what are they functioning doing? Because they're like, um, and I just oh, think, <laughs> I, do that. I go on autopilot. We all do. We're like, we, but we can't go on autopilot and lose another child. We've no. lost two in six months in rural Pennsylvania, where we all love each other. They're God fearing people in these neighborhoods. It, yeah. No. no show you, I mean, abuse happens happens everywhere. It doesn't just happen in big cities. You know, it happens in rural communities too. It it's does. We don't talk about it. Yeah. No, we don't talk about it. It's two weeks past the, when they buried Anson, and and that's not in the news anymore. It's no. it it's a non-issue. It was a bleep on on a someone's 
media site and now it's not there. And that's what we try as advocates. We try to keep that bleep alive and that's right. meaningful. That's right. And, yeah. and I think a lot of t like education um, is really key. education because back in the day, my parents were born in the 20s uh -huh. and they, you know, they were abused themselves. Um, I don't think they were sexually abused, but they were abused and they, that's how they grew up. So that's how they raised their children. Um, and unfortunately, because they weren't happy, they were abused. Their marital problems were uh, always at a crisis level. So the abuse just kind of spilled over to the children. Um, and, you know, as far as the CSA child sexual abuse, it was my brother, my older brother. He was um, 21 and I was eight, so he was 13 years older than me. I did tell my mother what was going on. Uh, at first I didn't because he had threatened my life. Right. And, and he, but it kept, kept on happening and I was starting to get very sick. So I did, I did tell my mom and my mom just, got angry at me and said, you know, you deal with it. It's not my problem. Yeah. Right. And I was it's like, you. well, okay. <laughs> well, my mom was my main abuser. So it's kind of like, oh, well. Um, so, you know, this is the thing. And people, I've had people ask me, well, why didn't you go to, a, uh, why didn't you go to a school teacher and tell a teacher? Well, I didn't know what was happening. I was like eight years old. I mean, I knew what was happening. I didn't understand the whole thing, like why it was happening. Um, and I also didn't want to be removed from my home. We had already been, the um, CPS had been involved already and okay. they were threatening to remove all of us from the home when I was very young, but um, they allowed us to stay in the home and the abuse just continued on with my parents. Both of my parents were abusing all of us really, but my brother sexually abused me, but he was very, very messed up and uh, psychologically unwell. And I'm not sure if my dad sexually abused him. I just don't know. You know what I mean? There was a, there's a lot of issues that are, are unknown. And I'll never know because he committed suicide. And, um, and I'm so very I am so very Well, this is, this is the, this is the, like a cycle of abuse, you know? Um, and people like my mom, I, when I told her, she was so stressed out. She, she just couldn't deal with it. I'm sure. You know what I mean? It's kind of like you deal with it. She was, that's the problem with abuse and, you know, abuse period. It, it normally happens. Okay. Where does abuse happen? Where the children are. So where are the children? Most, right. most abuse happens in the home and especially CSA child sexual abuse. So, you know, it's it, where are the children at home? So it's a parent, a caregiver, you know, uh, somebody that the family knows and trusts and lets be around the children and they don't suspect that that person would ever abuse a child. Sometimes it's, you know, it's a relative, a distant relative, you know, it's somebody who has access to the child. Right. And it's like, you know, we're, the, the education levels back in them days were zero. I mean, people had no concept of or that you should even protect your children from child sexual abuse. That's insane. Um, now today there's a lot more, you know, because people have been shouting out about this advocates that prior to us, you know, prior to our voices have been making a lot of noise. Thankfully, we're just adding ours to theirs. But the issue is, is that, you know, the edu education is key. You know, you have to, you have to know who's around your children. You know, you can't trust just because grandpa, you know, you love grandpa or you love grandma doesn't mean that they're not, that they're not capable of sexually abusing a child. Anybody can abuse a child. So it's kind of, anybody, anybody. Yeah. The, so it's like, look at the church. You know, you know we, we have so many faults, fault levels that it, we used to think coaches were safe. We used to think that, uh, you know, people that were in the church were safe. When we find out that there are some people who are wonderful and God fearing and good, beautiful people, but then there's one, you know, bad apple and, and then maybe it makes two. But if we have any inkling, that's what I'm saying. It takes but a moment. We see something, say something. It, I, 
I don't know how hard that is. And then we, on top of this, we do have tr problems with alcohol, drug abuse. We have kids getting younger and younger. They're still kids themselves making babies that they think are, we can ask a wish list of that newborn child to be all the things that they need in their life. Well, isn't that wonderful to give a brand new newborn baby an agenda because you need to feel loved? It's not about you, darling. It's about what can you provide that child? And we have to think. I'm, I'm not saying that there are not some wonderful parents who, who were teenagers oh, that's when right. they became parents. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, though, is there are those few out there who the last thing they needed was the responsibility of a child, of another human being. Mm -hmm. And we're not ready. Yeah. And, uh, oh, I pray. I must pray like every night, an hour, just for all the things that. I would like to see, you know, just fixed. Yeah. But we can't, we can't fix, fix. We can't fix. We can just do our best to report. That's right. And just, and like, just keep, you know, education. Like I said, I mean, I consider your book, Frozen Tears, to be part of that education where people and, you know, parents and teachers and Anybody who has anything to do with children <laughs> can, you know, use these tools and, you know, and, and, and make it and actually make an impact with, with, with children um, to teach them that, yeah, you're, you know, you can say no. It is okay to say no. Your body belongs to you. you yes. Know, you don't have, you know, just because somebody wants you to hug them doesn't mean that you have to. You can say no. Just because, you know, there's all this, uh, there's all sorts of good info out there if parents and teachers and, you know, would, will, will adapt that and actually use it, which I know a lot of them are, which is great, but we still need more done. And that's kind of why, you know, this interview is really important, Maureen, because, you know, our voices really do count because we're only, there's only so many people speaking out about this stuff. There's only so many. The rest are just kind of la 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 la, what's for lunch? I'm painting my nails. I really don't care about the kids down the street. And um, but when it's their child and somebody, somebody abuses or molests one of their children, then it's the end of the world, right? And it's like, come on, we care about all the children. I don't even have children because of the CSA child sexual abuse I suffered. I, I was made burned by it, so I can not have children. So I was not allowed to have children, unfortunately. And I, I love children. I will always love the children and speak out against child abuse and stand up for child rights mm -hmm. and even though i don't have children so there you go it doesn't have you don't have to be a parent to do this um there are yeah. anybody can be a, uh, an eye a, a watchdog you know <laughs> two sets of eyes out there you know it's like i see you you know what i mean watching out for children in your neighborhood watching out for children around you you're you, if you have children yourself you know watching out for grandchildren watching out for with their little playmates, just keeping an eye, keeping an ear open, um, and yeah, just make sure. I believe that we, you and I, I believe that people said, well, why do you believe that the abuse happened to you? I think that's the wrong story or the wrong question. I think the question and the answer is it happened to us and now we have a responsibility to take that and work, take our experience as terrible as it was, as challenging as it is, take that and help pass on laws that if they need to be passed, passed on information to those who just think they already know it. it wait, what do you mean child abuse? Well, that's not a big problem, is it? What do you, you I mean, I thought she was literally crazy when she, I thought, oh my gosh, what kind of people say this? Um, you know, what is wrong with you? Uh, you know, I never, well, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe I was hearing it. It's like, oh my gosh, you really believe that? I had a drug at a, a, a drug pusher tell me, I don't sell drugs to kids. I only sell drugs to adults. I said, really? I said, how can you guarantee that when they go home, 
and they put that pill down on the table that the kid kids grab for things and put them in their mouth. How can you guarantee that something like that wouldn't happen and that child, that infant have an overdose? What's well, not my problem? I said, oh, I said, when they're under the influence of that pill that you sold them, are they being a good parent? Well, I don't know. That's not my problem. I said, your problem is that you don't that you don't see that you are a problem. You are creating this by you selling and that. Well, I don't take. I'm not one of those people that uses and sells sells them. And I'm like, I can't believe what I'm hearing. You're trying to justify that you sell drugs. And I'm trying to explain to you that I understand that it's a means to an end for you, a financial, a financial transaction. But that financial transaction has ramifications. The same as it would if you took a bottle of Tylenol and left the lid off. The same mm -hmm. as if you leave the lid off of your uh, detergent pod. Oh, yeah. That's right. You have and and the the younger these children are having children, they're still not growing up yet, and they still don't have all the answers to give no. to that child. And that's why we all have to again. It does take a village. I know my friend, our friend Donna, says that often. It takes a village, Maureen. It takes a village. We don't want to get, you know be in everybody's life. That's not what this is about. But when you see something, say something. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's awesome. And if my book can help a little bit, that that would be amazing. It'd be that's amazing. Right. Yeah, and I think it does. Um, because like I'm always saying, you know, by people, anybody who advocates, you know, for children and stands up, you know, to speak out against child abuse in any, in any way, shape or form, um, is actually keeping it from being swept back under the carpet. Because is, if, if we, if our voices go away and we stop advocating and there's no more noise and chatter that's bothering all these people so that they're having a miserable day because they have to see these child abuse, you know, reports or information about child abuse, <laughs> it depresses them, well, you know, too bad because children are dying. And, you know, and, I mean, even if you don't die, they're, they're, they're suffering abuse. And, you know, what, we're supposed to just forget about it and shut up and go away? See, as long as we're speaking out, writing our books, reading our blogs, whatever we're doing in whatever media, medium or format, doesn't matter. As long as we're out there, and it doesn't get put back under the carpet. And that's why I think it's so important, you know, because like you, I've had people, you know, when I tell them what I do, I just call myself a child abuse prevention a public speaker, an advocate, I've had people say, well, we don't want to hear about that. That's depressing. No, I, I, yes, I was <laughs> to a library, uh, invited me to speak about my book. And then all of a sudden they disinvited me. He said, you know, talking about child abuse would really be, be a bummer. And I, I really, and I'm like, it's not <laughs> supposed to be sunshine and lollipops. It's supposed to be an action, you know, people brought to action. That's what the whole book is supposed to help. It's supposed to help the healing and those who are victims. And it's supposed to help the safe people. Maybe they say, wow, this has affected me. I didn't know this happened to my great niece or, or you know, or my nephew or, or my cousin three sheets over, you know, all those different levels of, of cousins that I, I don't understand. I like to call myself an aunt. That right. way the, <laughs> it's easier. One third cousin unrelated or related. I, that bothers me. I, I want to be called Aunt Maureen. And that way, I like it. I don't know, stuff is too confusing. <laughs> and the other thing we have to stop, and if we're going to be well-educated, well-rounded individuals, can we please stop patting ourselves on the back and say, oh, well, I donated a few dollars into a jar or in a plate, and that's going to take care of all of the abuse. Can we please re-educate ourselves that that advocacy costs money? It does. Money doesn't grow on trees, and we are dependent on the charity of many people. And I and I'm not saying that every dollar doesn't help, but please don't convince yourself that by 
throwing a couple dollars at a situation, you've done a wonderful thing. This is a 365 day, 24 mm seven. -hmm. And while we spoke here tonight, five children, almost five children today have died um, from abuse. And hundreds of thousands of children have been abused yeah. in, in the moments that we've spent talking here tonight. Now, that is unacceptable. And I'm all for saving the whales and, and the, the polar bears. They're cute as a button. I, I want to save them all, but I also want to save children. That's right. And it's, uh, it's strange, you know, how many people will support other things right and i'm all for it too animal protection I, you know they're living creatures they have every right to be protected and to live and i'm all for that too but it's because they're so cute and furry and fluffy and whatever everybody yeah people just you know it's like oh i want to support that and it's like you know i'm and then i post a, a post about you know some some group that's helping you know stop child abuse and i get no likes no hearts no nothing you know what i mean it's kind of like it shows you where people's hearts are. And, well, you know, if it, like, you're for right. me, you know, if, if, if that's why I went public with my story and that's why I started speaking out publicly. And I, a lot of people in my, well, I don't have much family left, but the few that were there <laughs> didn't like it because they, they just thought I should just shut up and go away. But the thing is, is I'm like, no, because, you know, the only good that come, the, the only way I can make peace and justify what happened to me and to my family and my siblings um, and the destruction of my family and the abuse and the horrors, the only thing that I can, that, that I can say that's good is that that's not the end of the story. The good has to come out of this. You know, yeah. we... Me, like for me to just go and be silent and not say anything and all this, you know, that's just to me, that's just saying, oh, well, the abuse kind of like abuse won. For me, it's like it's my fight to make as much noise as I possibly can <laughs> while I'm here because that's that tells me that I won the fight, I win the battle because something good's going to come out of this. Because as long as all of our voices are out here together we all can't do one person can't do it it no. takes like yeah. it's a village right it takes it's all of our so as long as we can stir people up and say come on now you know you know pay attention watch out for the children around you you know what i mean just little reminders um you know then then that's a good thing that's good that, that that i can say makes the whole thing worthwhile for me you know what i mean Absolutely. So I had to go public. I had to do this. I wasn't going to be able to just sit there and be quiet and not not speak out. You know, I thought, I know all about this abuse and garbage. And, you know, why am I sitting here not saying anything? I'm for, I know firsthand what this is all about. Uh, I have every right to speak out. But if people have, you know, survivors of abuse have the right to be live their lives peaceably and quiet, too. And that's Lots fine. A lot of yeah. families put pressure on them to keep quiet. Don't talk about it. I've, I've come to the realization that every family is dysfunctional on some level. Oh, <laughs> so sure. it is yeah. no surprise that, that, oh, our family, we were a bit dysfunctional. Yeah, we were. Okay, now get, get past that. Um, we all have idiosyncrasies, but I, I want to thank you so much for letting me come on and, and share my book. And I hope that it opens eyes and hearts to a, a, a change that we need in this country. And I, we desperately need to change this. We were, I don't know if people realize that the SPCA, mm -hmm. we pro had laws written to protect animals before we had laws on the book to protect children. And yeah. even when the process started, it took 14 years for it to go through all the shenanigans and politics and things. Um, all the, the trails it has to go through before it gets passed and all this. 14 years? It, and uh, it's, insane, it's insane to me that. It is. It, it's insane. It's, what do you mean 14 years? You, you saw that abuse of a dog needed laws but when you talk about a child you don't think that child needs protection are you crazy 
Yeah, I mean, I mean it's a problem. The world, I mean, I don't, I'm not just, I'm just saying worldwide. Oh, yes. Yes. Children's lives don't mean that much. They really don't. Yeah. And not, not to the, not to the lawmakers and not, you know, seriously, like the government, they, nobody cares. You know what I mean? That's why these people that are abusing and killing children get away with these very light sentences. You know, it's like, oh, slap on the wrist. Okay, you got to go to jail. You got to go to prison for about three, four years for killing your child. Then they come out. It's been a proven fact. They come out like a year later because they get a time. They, they don't do the full sentence because they get you know, time off for good behavior, or they've already served part of it in jail, right? It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. And then they go out and they have more children, and they kill those children. Now, this is a this is for real. Oh. Um, and where is the public outcry? Where is the public? You know, it's kind of like, um, no, there is no outcry for for abused children, and that's why we have to be their voice. That's why I mean, hey, we're a voice for those children, and your book is a book for to be a voice for those children and and i love it so we've got about four minutes I'm, 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 I'm really honored to have you as a guest and i'm thankful you could come on my show and and spend this time with me because this is like so important and i wanted to just look at um, like your books available at many locations and what i'll do is on this description in youtube here i will include i i, I did include the amazon link Okay, um, but I think I'll go. I'll, I'll I'll grab a few more links to see if I can fit them in there. But where else is your book available at? I think I'm going to uh, the outlets that we currently have. We're looking at expanding that, but at this per present time, let's. Um, I'm blessed with the opportunities that I've been given, so um, I think we will be able to um, give you that information in the future. Oh, okay. Oh, that's yep. cool. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. No, this was great. And I think um, it's just so important. Do you have any plans to write any more books or do any I think blogging? I have more books in me. Yes, I do. I do. <laughs> you got some more in there? I do too, actually. I've, they've been, they, they were put off for a bit, but, but I'll get to them. <laughs> I do. Well, it's been great, Maureen. I really appreciate it. So Thank we have you. just a couple minutes and, um, now I know you're, you're a child advocate and a public speaker yes. and what do you see for like, for your future plans? Oh, no. I'd like to continue to be a voice as long as they'll have me, um, continue to like you, like yourself, get the word out. I mean, it's, we can't make. Apparently, there is a, such an adverse, an adversity that people have toward these subjects. And I really think we have to just change that. Let's change that into optimism and I think that and change. <laughs> Good plan. <laughs> I like it. And what what word of encouragement would you have for someone who's been abused and suffered CSI child sexual abuse and still hasn't, you know, re reached out for help and is struggling, what word of encouragement would you have for someone in that position? Reach out, find someone safe. It could be a girlfriend. It could be, uh, an, you know, someone that you know that if you, if you can loan them five bucks and you know they're going to pay it back, that's pretty safe person. <laughs> Most people, you give them five bucks, you never see it again. But if you know they're going to pay that back, that's probably a good bet that they're going to listen to you and take your story to heart. And they're probably not going to have all the conditions or look at you badly or all the things that you have already prepared in your head that they won't love you anymore. I love you. I know Laurie loves you. So do the Donna Shears, the men and women who are on the front lines of advocacy. Some of us have been there, and we love you. And if you need us, for you. That's right. Just reach out. Keep reaching out. That's what I always say too. <laughs> so important. 
Well, thank you so much, Maureen. It has been such a pleasure, and oh. I appreciate you spending this time with me. And um, I wish you the best. Uh, like we're friends anyway, so <laughs> but, but uh, so I'll get to see your upcoming stuff. But for anybody who you know who hasn't seen Maureen's books, click on the links below, check it out, and you know you can you can follow what she's doing. It's great. So you have a wonderful night, Maureen. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.